So risk and return part three. This is an example of diversification. We're going to be then talking about systematic and unsystematic risk and introduce the concept of beta. Let's take a share and assume it has a price of $100 and it will provide a return of either $20 or $0 with a 50-50 probability. Now, we can also calculate it as a percentage return. That would be 20% or 0% return. What is the expected return? Well, the expected return would be the weighted average, which is $10 or 10%. Again, we could do the weighted average as a percentage, half of 20%, half of 0%. Now, let's imagine a second share, calling it B. Same idea, costs $100 and providing a, a, prob a return of either 20 or 0 with a 50% probability. Well, what's the difference between these two shares? Well, it will provide a return of 0% when A return gives a return of 20 and $20 when A gives 0. So that's so the return is literally the mirror image. So what's the expected return on this share? Well, again, $10 or 10%. So what if I invest $200, that means $100 in A and $100 in B. So what would happen to the return? Well, one of the shares will provide $20 return and the other share will give you nothing because when A has gives you 20, then B gives you zero. When A gives you tw zero, B gives you 20. So you will always receive a return of $20 for that investment of 200. So your expected return hasn't changed. You will receive a 10% return, but in this case, the variance or the standard deviation have become zero. You will guaranteed always receive a 10% return. So that's the whole idea that goes in behind diversification. So here we have a perfect negative correlation between the two shares. Perfect co negative correlation means when one goes up, the other one goes down. Perfect positive would be the opposite. When one goes up, the other one go always goes up. And perfect means it always happens. Now, this is not a realistic scenario, but it gives you an idea what the point is behind the diversification. Now, let's think about this. As let's assume that the market rate for a guaranteed return is 5%. So for sure, if you want to invest in something and get a guaranteed return, let's say, you know, treasury bond, 5% return. Well, you could invest in sh one share of A and one share of B each at $100, and then you would always prefer this combination to a guaranteed return of 5%, since the one we're talking about here would give you a guaranteed 10%. So what would happen? Demand for these shares would increase. You could actually borrow, at a, technically speaking, you could borrow at a risk-free rate of 5% and then invest that money in A and B and then earn a, uh, a positive return at a zero cost. So what would happen is the, share of the, the price of these shares would increase. So let's pretend the new share price is $150. So an investment of $300, that means one in each, will still yield a 20% return. Uh, sorry, $20 return, not 20%, because we're about to calculate the percentage return. And that means the return would be $20 over $300, so 6.67%. So it's gone down from 10% because you're paying now $100 more for the two shares. But still, it's higher than 5%. So it's not a great as great a deal, but it is preferable to 5% guaranteed return. So... We, as we see, the investors would bid up the price of these shares and up to what point? Well, that point would occur when the price or the return of the portfolio will match the actual return on a guaranteed portfolio. Since the return to this portfolio, one share of A when one share of B, is a guaranteed $20 for, for that, when that becomes 5%. So the price would end up being $200 a share for because it each has the expected return of 10 dollars so 10 divided by 200 is five percent so that is the basic premise or the idea behind diversification and how we're going to se uh, separate out the concept of the diversifiable risk and the undiversifiable risk that we can which we cannot diversify by buying other shares so the market squeezes out the risk premium for diversifiable or systematic risk it doesn't we retain the risk premium for 
undiversifiable risk. But for the, the, that which we can diversify, the market will squeeze it out because it will price it out. So investors, since they're not rewarded for taking diversifiable risk, we separate out the total risk, which is measured as sigma, the standard deviation, into two components. The total risk is therefore the diversifiable plus the undiversifiable risk. Now, by its nature, undiversifiable risk is, thus called, is called systematic risk because it's in the system. As long as we're invested in the market, aside from the risk-free assets, for example, well, there are government bonds and which gives us a guaranteed return. Those are the risk-free assets. But everything else has a uh, has a un undiversifiable or systematic risk associated with it. So a measure for this risk has been developed and it's called beta. Sometimes it's shown as the Greek letter, beta. And so the way we now can consider the total risk, we'll say, we'll call it the total risk equals the unsystematic or the diversifiable risk plus the beta risk. And why are we interested? Because that's the one that we get paid for. So beta is a measure of the sensitivity of an asset's value to the value of the market. The market being the most broadly diversified set of assets. So the idea of the market return premium, now that's the difference between the market return and the risk-free rate. If that increases by 1%, then the asset return will increase by beta percent. So it's a linear relationship between beta and the market return premium. So graphically, you see it like this. This is the security market line. We have here on the y-axis the expected return, and on the x-axis we have beta. And as we see here, the expected return of a share can be measured as you have a beta of a share, and then you have an expected return. And technically, or theoretically, the shares would be on this line, which is called a security market line, and the risk-free rate would be sitting here. We're showing it at 2.6% in this example. And uh, the market rate of return would match uh, expect a beta of one. So we can see it like this. The expected return of a given asset minus the risk-free rate is equal to beta of that asset times the market return minus the risk-free rate. And we can rearrange that to the common form of the equation as we see it here. There's a lot of subscripts, but it's, it's, once you're familiar with it, it's not too crazy. So the E of R is the expected return of the asset. Beta I is the beta of that asset, risk-free market rate. And RM is the expected return on the market. So that is the capital asset pricing model. So in what it does is it represents what's considered a fair return and therefore a fair price for a risky asset. So the market has a beta of 1, as you can see, because if you have beta of 1, you have RF plus RM minus RF, so that gives us RM. So expected return on the market is 1 where you have beta equals 1. So graphing the beta versus expected return is a straight line, as we just saw, and with the vertical axis is the return, beta is x, and then we'll have, it looks like mx plus b, where m is the slope, which is the market risk premium, and b is the y-intercept, which is the risk-free rate, because beta equals zero means zero uh, diversifiable risk, uh, undi yeah, undiversifiable risk, sorry, and that means we have our risk-free rate. So that is how you see how beta is a risk that's rewarded with a return. So if you take a look at this, here's an example. Again, the same cur the same line, but now we have an asset A and an asset B. Now B gives us a higher return and risk than A, but B is below the line and A is above the line. So according to the, the theory then, A and B are mispriced. They're not on the security market line, and that would be the equilibrium price and remember that we're talking return versus beta, but the return and price are connected as we had with our examples beforehand. Uh, as the price of a share goes down, that means the expected return, assuming nothing's changed with the expected actual return in dollars, that means the expected return as a percentage will go up when the price goes down and vice versa. So B has a higher expected return, but too low. it's too low for the risk. So our, the level of risk is here. It's rather far along. So the, risk, the return is higher, but it should actually be at this level. 
and A is the opposite, it provides a better risk-adjusted return. We have, for the level of risk here, A is giving a higher, is, is higher return than what it would be expected by the market. So as is the case for the expected return, the beta of a portfolio is the weighted average of the betas of individual shares of the portfolio. And this is uh, one of the strengths of this, uh, of the theory. We can simply calculate the beta for a set of shares by weighting up the, uh, or calculating the weighted average betas. So how do we do that? You start off here, we have three shares, A, B, and C with betas as, as shown. And we have this much invested for a total of $10,000. So we calculate the weights. Well, the weight of, one, of A is one-tenth. So it's 1,000 over 10,000. So that's one-tenth of the portfolio. And then we do the same with B and C. That gives us half and 40% of the portfolio for the total value. And then we just do the weighted average. And then you just take 1.8 times 0 0.1. That gives 0 0.18. That's a beta contribution for A. We do the same with B and C, and then we end up with a portfolio beta of 0 0.86. What that means, translated again, is if we if the the market return increases by 1%, we expect this portfolio return to increase by 0.86%. And of course, in the uh, other direction, as it goes negative as well. So thank you for your attention, and hope that helped.